What women want requires more than one hour. I've had guys come on me, I've had guys spit on me. I can get fucking dicked down by like three massive 14 inch black guys at me and I'm like, yes, give me more, give me more. And I just turn around to them, I'm like, do you mind if I take a photo? Because no one's going to believe me when I tell them this story. They want to be wined and dined and 69, obviously. Laid down like a man and they fuck me like a female. Yeah, I didn't think it would be as fulfilling. Like, I'm really happy with the way that I've changed. I'm making a lot more out of myself now. By giving to other people, that gives me happiness. My name is Brando Conti. Natasha Ambrose. Bo Valentine. Olive May, and I am a stripper and a sex worker. I am from Kangaroo Valley, which is a tiny country town with absolutely nothing in it. I grew up really in a really comfortable inner city, liberal, middle class, public schools, but good public schools. Very estranged family split up. So bouncing from relatives, mum, dad, here and there, everywhere, really. Had a very blessed childhood, very lucky and happy. Oh, my family always wanted the best for me. So they guided me towards some really nice career paths. So I was in the army for two years, practiced law for three years, became a chef. And then I had another life experience, which was marriage. <laughs> and that didn't work for me. I chose to move into sex work to augment another career in a, you know, sort of relatively normal industry. <laughs> I have no idea how I ended up here. I kind of just did it. We were living down in Nara. Canberra was close to us. We we're like, let's go to Canberra, become strippers. Worst idea of my life. <laughs> I was having lots of, you know, casual sex for my own enjoyment. And I was like, well, damned if I'm not getting really good at this. <laughs> and um, maybe someone should pay me for it. I had a friend that was doing it. And then all of a sudden, overnight, like that, he just was swimming in cash. He was like, oh, well, don't tell anyone, but I'm doing this. And he showed me what he was doing, and I was like, I could do that. So I took it and ran with it. So I realized that I was still looking for the profession that I really wanted to do because I love women and I love helping people. I thought, why not combine the two things and become a male escort? It um, frees up a lot of time. If I'm um, doing bookings and getting paid for having fun, then after the booking I can do whatever else I want to do with my life. If I wasn't escorting, then I'd be spending a lot of time having sex. And then I'd have to go to work and make money. And I'd have no spare time. So I sort of did a bit of research and a couple of profiles up online and my mum helped me deck out my apartment right. <laughs> yeah, look, she's not totally comfortable. She's she's um, she's a bit like Amy Poehler um, in Mean Girls. If we're gonna do it, she'd rather we do it in the house, you know? <laughs> yeah, I started just advertising online with my partner at the time. We were doing, we were doing it together and individually as well. Got some international clients and just slowly built up. And then I was working at an agency for a little while but then they take like half your money. So we just left and started doing it privately. I started cam girling first and then I went to stripping and then I did OnlyFans after that. And it blew up straight away the moment I got into it and promoting it at the strip club, I get a lot of subscriptions from there as well. So a lot of the people, if they'll take me for a private dance, I'll usually give them like a 50% off code to my OnlyFans. They're gonna purchase from there and see all my videos from there because they've already seen what I look like. They know they're gonna enjoy it. I did my research first to see what the competition was like. And then I start training very, very hard to be in the best physical shape possible. But I also did a lot of studies about human behavior relationship, uh, men and women. That brought me to the right mindset and got me ready to start. What I didn't expect was the amount of bookings with couples. It's actually the majority of my bookings. After that, it's more like companionship that I get booked for. Women in their 30s up to their 70s, late 70s. All they want is 
companionship, intimacy, which is not just sex, but they want touch, they want connection. This is the main reason why I get hired. The scariest thing is not knowing. Um, and so to begin with, I religiously asked clients for a photo just so I knew who would be walking in the door. And nowadays I don't do that so much. I've always since the very get-go had a security person online. The way that I do that is to flip them a quick text message when the client has arrived, just saying, yep, he's here, you know, he looks like his photo, or he seems like a nice guy, all good. And then likewise, just as the booking is ending. So if they don't receive in either of those two text messages, then, you know, they storm the building with all guns blazing and kick in the doors and they, you know, are very masculine, sexy and... <laughs> Not really, they don't have guns. Um, it's, it's just like my, my boyfriend. <laughs> um, or my, he's, he's my ex now. Oh, we're gonna have to look at whether that's gonna still keep happening. Relationships suck doing any form of sex work, I think. I was dating a lot of just normal people, but they also didn't know that I had done OnlyFans or stripping or anything like that. Um, and then one of my exes, we actually did an OnlyFans together for a while. We had like a couple channel when I first started it back up and it was just me and him. And then we'd do like threesomes with other girls. Um, and then we did a fivesome with like five other girls and him. And then that kind of ended the relationship. <laughs> Why is that? He ended up just continuously fucking one of the other girls, like, behind my back. I had a fabulous affair with a trans guy in London back in 2014 or something before I was working. Um, long before I was working, before I was properly a woman even. He almost got pregnant and then I was going to, like, move to Manchester and be a mother slash father slash parent thing. And um, that was wild. I've been in a relationship for two years now. Yeah, and I've been escorting for nearly one year. I keep my professional life very separate from my private life. And I'm so lucky that my partner understands and not only understands, but supports what I do. I don't really conform to the idea of monogamy. I think it's really old fashioned, almost irrelevant in the 21st century. People have this thought that you have a finite amount of love that you can give in your life. And if you give your love to someone, you can't give your love to someone else. And that's not at all how the body works or the mind works. I'm polyamorous and I'm pansexual. So I don't think it really affects me at all. I'm, I'm very upfront about what I do with people that I meet and the type of person that I'm happy to be in a relationship with or be affectionate or romantic with is the type of person that won't really care. The other thing that was kind of I was worried about, I suppose, is that obviously when you're having sex for fun, you know, you curate out the people you're not hot for. Um, and, um, and I was like, what am I gonna do if it's someone that's just like totally, you know, anathema to my physical tastes or whatever. It was relatively early on. I wasn't particularly kind of physically attracted to him. And uh, he really wanted me to, to fuck him, to top him. And I just like could I just couldn't keep it up. <laughs> I was the estrogen doesn't help, um, and you know like a Viagra can counteract for some of that, but you know it's always a kind of a matter of can you, can, can you keep it there? And I'm not a natural top. I mean I'm told I'm very good at it, but it's not something that comes natural to me. I I now tend to say to clients I don't guarantee that on the first booking um, so that I can get a sense of our vibe but you know I was messaging with this cute little twinkie boy last night who's a bit obsessed with me fucking him and and whenever he's around because he's like super cute and um uh and hot and uh it's not a problem <laughs> and there's a lot of clients that you'll get and you're like okay I actually want to do this job like I, no complaints that's just human attraction and then on the flip side, you have the really, really horrible ones that you don't want to do. But the good thing about both the places that I work, I can say yes and no to them. So I do say no to a lot of people because I'm just picky. The, the, the sex drive thing is something to be managed. Yeah, it does, it does sap to a certain extent, which is why, I, well, one of the reasons I think among the, um, particularly among the T-girls, we tend to put that like, I come plus 200 bucks because once you've, like, once that's happened, you kind of, 
you know, not necessarily done for the day, but like you could be done for the day. Coming is not something that comes so easily after you're um, on hormones for a while as well. So, what, you know, it's a negotiation and I'm not super kinky myself, except that I just find like the concept of sluttiness really hot. Um, <laughs> the sluttiness thing in a glorification way, like I'm a big fan of that porn star, Adriana Chechik, who's just like, I can get, you know, fucking dicked down by like three massive 14 inch black guys and they can be fucking pounding away at me. And I'm like, yes, give me more, give me more. And they can't fuck her hard enough that she wants them to stop. Um, and I'm like, life goals. <laughs> That's hot. Like, you know, it, being good at something is hot, you know, um, <laughs> even if it's just like getting fucked six ways from Sunday and railed like a freight train. Um, <laughs> I pride my, myself on, you know, being something of a throat goat, which I just found out the other day what that actually means. I always thought, right, <laughs> that the throat goat um, <laughs> was something to do with that like hacking, gagging noise <laughs> that sounds like the goat in the Adina Menzel video clip. Anyway, <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's the greatest of all time thing and I had never put those two things together. <laughs> you know, there's, there's pride in being good at your job. Um, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Sometimes people with money can be arrogant and sometimes they think that because they're paying me they can do whatever they want with me and but that's certainly not the case it's not certainly my case because respect for me comes before everything otherwise I'm sorry but I'm gonna have to leave the scene and this is actually what happened once I was in a couple booking and the agreement was that the husband was supposed to be sitting in the car holding chair for the length of the booking. And all of a sudden, I found him on the bed next to me, naked. I was really sorry, but I had to leave the scene because my boundaries weren't respected. That was my only bad experience, actually, up until now. <laughs> Whenever you tell people that they're not allowed to touch because our club is a no-touching club, it always riles a lot of men up. And that would be like the biggest factor that a lot of girls face in a strip club when the club doesn't allow touching is that people will still try to. They will grab you, they will touch you. I've had guys come on me. I've had guys spit on me. They have poured drinks down me. Like you get some really horrible vulgar people in there that just don't know how to behave themselves. The one that came on me, I literally ran out of the room naked. <laughs> That was absolutely horrible. The club actually let that guy stay. That was when I was working down in Canberra. It was like my second or third night stripping too. I've had like negative interactions with clients. One that comes to mind is a, a guy that came to see me at my place and he, um, how do I say it? He had to turn sideways to fit through the front door. So that's fine. Like not, not gonna discriminate, but he stank like rotting flesh and yeah it it was just bad so i was like well i'm gonna jump in the shower do you want to jump in the shower with me he goes no i showered before i came and i was like mm -hmm. well i'm gonna jump in the shower so you might as well join me because otherwise you're going to be here by yourself and he goes no hurry up you're wasting time yeah wasn't clean and wasn't making a decent attempt to get clean and i wasn't going to see him and it was just rude. So I was like, okay, I'm really sorry. So we're not gonna be able to spend any time together. Here's your money back. And that was the one and only time that I've ever like turned down a client or asked a client to leave. And I'm, I'm very conscious about doing that because like, let's be honest, being rejected by an escort, that's like suicide inducing stuff. Like you can't even rent someone to lay in bed naked with you if that's, that could be the straw that breaks the camel's back and I'm very conscious of that before I, before I do it. It's $500 an hour or $5,000 per day. I have a minimum of two hours and there's actually no maximum because I can get booked for a whole week. The majority of my booking go from six hours up to 48, 72 hours. That's let's say the majority of them. What women want 
requires more than more than one hour actually because women want connection. When a woman wants to make love, wants, she wants his sex, but she wants her heart warmed up first. And to warm up their, her heart, it, it takes time, it takes talking, it takes connection. And that's why the length of the booking, is, it's substantial. I don't do this job for money. I would be hypocritic if I say I don't, I'm not interested in money. Money is big and it always helps but it's not, the re it's not the reason why I do what I do, because for, for me, it's more about helping people. So it's about contribution to the society and money is obviously good. My first ever night or probably at like the strip club I'm at now, probably be one of my most memorable. I started that club that night and I made eight and a half grand on a Thursday. I got booked in like what we call our champagne room with a bunch of these guys and they were just throwing hundreds and fifties on me and this other girl. And then the police came in and tackled them and literally dragged them out and arrested them for the rest of the night. It was one of the most chaotic nights I'd ever had. One of the best nights that I've made money. And for a Thursday, <laughs> it doesn't usually go off on a Thursday like that. Um, but also just the, the cops running in in full SWAT gear and tackling the guys, like that was rememberable. I've never seen them for the rest of my life. I think they're probably in jail. It was amusing. <laughs> I definitely have probably made more stripping than I have in sex work, honestly. I've made 11 grand on a night when I was working up in Queensland at a different club. That was on a Friday night, which is pretty damn good. There was a client really quite early on, actually, it set my standards pretty high, <laughs> who um, booked me to come see you at a hotel in town. Uh, we spent four or five hours together. I I think I left there with about that many grand. Yeah, so like, you can make really good money. Um, and then, you know, occasionally I'll, you know, take pity on a single dad and <laughs> do a booking for a couple hundred bucks. I'm like, oh, you look sad. <laughs> Come and hang out for a bit. I'll make you happy. <laughs> oh, that's... I can't give you an exact number, but if you think two, three clients a week, sometimes four, sometimes one, but averaging three clients a week, so you do your maths, it's 100, 150. I see somewhere between kind of five and seven or eight clients so most weeks, occasionally a little bit more than that. I just went to Canberra for a week straight after the referendum and that city was not happy in that week and I saw literally no one. Um, <laughs> because everyone was depressed and people have sex when they're sad but not when they're depressed. Okay, I have so many weird requests. I get a lot of them because I go to the gym a lot, I have quite a lot of muscles. I have a lot of guys that just tip me to do pull-ups naked for them. A lot of guys for some reason absolutely love that or they go for my sweat every single time. Every guy has always tried to just like wipe off my sweat and lick it. I don't know what it is like I'm a very sweaty person, but like they are always so all over my sweat. One guy's asked to buy my sweat, to buy my socks, my shoes, my underwear. One guy's asked to buy my hair. Um, one guy asked if I could take out my eyelash extensions and if I could sell my eyelash extensions to him. And then we've had the guys that have asked me at the brothel to lay down like a man and they fuck me like a female. It is the weirdest request and I don't know where the guys have gotten this from, but like, it's horrible. It's actually horrible. <laughs> so many. I had a client like a week ago who said to me, oh, do you have any beach wear? So I like pull out my lifeguard board shorts and like my lifeguard um, shirt and he rocks up and he pulls out flippers. And I just turned around to him, I'm like, do you mind if I take a photo? Because no one's going to believe me when I tell them this story. He said beachwear, and it was my fault for making assumptions. What I found strange in a couple of cases, in a couple of bookings, was that a young woman in her 30s was hiring me for an overnight booking, and all she asked for was just touch and cuddles. I was expecting to have him to perform all night, and that wasn't the case. Some, some clients want that, 
and they can have that obviously. <laughs> but I found it strange that someone can hire me and pay $4,000 just to be cuddled, which is, <clears throat> I understand. So it's, it's, it's what women need. One of the risks in sex work is, is the risk of sexual assault, which is not, um, not a nice thing, uh, obviously. I had an experience with a, um, with a client and I, interestingly, I, I continued the conversation around this with him by text message afterwards. What had happened was he brought with him some uh, GHB, which is a drug that people, you know, use recreationally. And it's also a drug that gets used to date rape people. I consensually had a small amount and that was fine with me. Um, in hindsight, I now don't take G with clients. We're fooling around and so on and so forth, and you know, one assumes the position um, <laughs> on hands and knees, so you know, shoulder and knee looking back over you, like the full porn star thing that they love. Um, <laughs> and I wasn't paying super close attention, and he um, filled the you know the the barrel of a syringe without the needle in it with another couple of mils of, of this drug and just like literally um, inserted it into me. I don't know, for those who don't know, GHB is a, is a drug that can be great fun, um, <laughs> but the difference between an effective, effective dose, a toxic dose and a lethal dose is really small. It's quite dangerous in that respect. And I, and I'd been, I, I, I knew I'd been violated. My consent had been, had been um, had not been sought for that and had been overridden. I'm not sure how obviously I was, you know, whether I was beating him away or whether I was um, vocalising because I was really fucked by this stage. But I do know very, very clearly that I had been curled up in a ball under the bed holding onto the bed leg and then I was back on the bed through no volition of my own. So, you know. That was fucked, basically. Yeah, it was really fucked. And that's kind of the, the, the least worst of it from what I've heard tales from, from other girls. It's just shit that um, we live in a world that there are enough guys that think that's an okay way to behave or that they haven't done anything wrong in that situation or maybe they know they've done something wrong, but they, this guy seemed certain that he had done nothing wrong. And I'm like, I, I'm trying to explain this to you that the breach of consent was the fact that you gave me drugs that I didn't want to have. Everything after that is non-consensual. Selling yourself. I, I really, I don't like that term when people say, oh, you're selling yourself because you're not. Um, you're renting yourself. I've seen clients that are porn stars, politicians, police, bikies. Everyone has an, a level playing field. And then at the end of our time together, I'm still the same person that I was. I'm still just as complete as I was. It's not mentally scarring or damaging or taking any sort of mental toll on me. People have this whole perception that it um, takes a, a, an emotional toll or it eats away at your soul or it stops you from having a, a stable relationship or a healthy family life or you must have come from a damaged childhood. None of this is true. Like, it's a good job for people who enjoy meeting people, who are really gregarious and can get a, along with all sorts of people from any kind of walk of life and enjoy sex. And that's me. And everybody fucks. Everybody fucks. Your parents fuck, your neighbors fuck, your teachers fuck, everybody fucks. So it's, it's yeah, it's a very um, leveling um, thought to have. And once you get your clothes off, like it doesn't matter if they're taking off high vis because they're a builder or they're taking off a suit because they're a lawyer. Once you're naked, everyone's even. We have older generations that are never going to accept certain ways of life and then we have young people that are never going to accept certain ways of life. Like if you don't want to do it, don't do it. Don't judge others for wanting to do it because we like this lifestyle. Working a day-to-day -day, like nine-to-five job absolutely sucked for me. I hated it. It was the worst segment of my whole entire life that I've had 
and stripping just gives a lot more fulfillment for me. The cash is so much better and I'm making a lot more out of myself now. I'm doing a lot more. I have a lot more free time and a lot of people don't understand how well sex work can work for a lifestyle where you want to travel, you want to go do things because you can do it anywhere at any time. There's daytime strip clubs and there's nighttime strip clubs. So no matter where you are in the world, you can go and you can get a job on the spot like that for this industry, which I think is absolutely phenomenal. Sometimes I think I wish I'd started earlier, but not really because when I was 20, 25, 30 years old, I didn't have the maturity that I've got now. I didn't have the knowledge that I've got now and the maturity of someone who is 40 years old had a marriage behind his back and a divorce behind his back and lots of life experience in different continents because if someone's fantasy is having me cooking a nice meal for them in the comfort of their own home, I can do that. I couldn't have done that 10 years or 15 years ago. Or if someone wants to talk to me about their marriage breakdown, and I understand now because I was married and I went through a divorce. So now I understand how things can go in that area. So it, all of this is continuous growth for me. So the more I know, the more, the more uh, I can give. Yeah, I didn't think it would be as um, kind of fulfilling as it, as it is. Um, people think of sex work as sex work, but there's a it's basically like sex therapy a lot of the time. I see a lot of clients that have been sexually abused and they're seeing an escort as a way to like reintroduce themselves to their sexual identity but in a controlled manner, which obviously has been taken away from them previously. I have changed and there are some elements of that an innocent little princess girl in me. <laughs> Um, kind of regrets. You, you've got to have a thick skin, you've got to build strong walls, you've got to be resilient to, to certain kinds of pain um, if you're going to stay in this industry and be happy and healthy. It's like a callus, you know, it's like it just, it doesn't feel quite as nice to be thick skinned in that way, but it's preferable to the alternative, which is, you know, not having a callus and then your skin getting punctured all the time. And we work kind of ways to try and, you know, have bits of our skin that we present to the client that are, you know, calloused and other bits that are hidden away from the client that we can, that are, that are soft and, and squishy that we can bring out just for lovers and boyfriends, you know, or friends and family even. And that's tough um, in its way. And then there are other ways in which I think, like, I'm really happy with the way that I've changed. I think my sexual horizons have broadened further and I think that's cool. Like, a, and you know, I also like, you know, I'm the throat guy. <laughs> that's new. <laughs> I was like, I was good at head before, but like, girl, this is like best in the hemisphere kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm exaggerating. I'm sure there are people who are just as good as me, but not better. Definitely not better. <laughs>